Welcome back to Chem 4300. In this video, we're going to continue Chapter 9 on magnetism, angular momentum, and spin. And now we're going to look at something called the stern gerlach experiment. Now, we've already gone through all the background physics to understand this experiment. But before we get to the experiment, I want to give you a little bit of hist historical background here. So back in 1896, if you remember, I told you that Pieter Zeeman discovered a clue about the atomic structure when he found that the, the uh, uh, yellow lines of sodium in a flame started to broaden out in the presence of a magnetic field. This became known as the Zeeman effect. So there was something about the constituents of, of the atom that were interacting with magnetic fields. In Bohr's 1913 theory uh, of the atom, he predicted that the angular momentum would be quantized. So that was an important first step. And, and so later, uh, after Bohr, Summerfield was taking Bohr's theory and trying to refine it. So this was before Schrodinger. So they were still working with this idea of Bohr's theory, but they didn't have de Broglie's hypothesis or anything like that. But Summerfield was working on Bohr's theory, and he came up with a way to describe uh, orbits that weren't circular, but actually were elliptical orbits. And he was able to describe those orbits by three quantum numbers, n, k, and m. Now, Generally speaking, this is really, isn't really that important for this course, but I want you to understand some of the historical context here. So he called n the principal quantum numbers. So these were values of 1, 2, and 3. K was called the azimuthal quantum number, which had values of 1 to n. And m values went from minus k to k. But one of the things that's interesting about Summerfield's theory is what, was that m of 0 was not allowed in this theory. So this M described the quantization of the Z component. So a lot of actually some of the, the, the language of the Schrodinger picture actually came out of Bohr's model. So it's, it's not surprising that some of these definitions are overlapping. Uh, but in the Summerfield model, the M describes the quantization of the Z component of the electron's orbital angular momentum. And so with some refinement, uh, the, the Summerfield was able to take Bohr's model and show that he could explain the Zeeman effect by showing this effect of the orbital magnetic dipole moment on this number, this m value, which is the, the magnetic quantum number. So in 1922, Stern and Garlock set out to try to prove this idea based on Sommerfeld's model of the atom, or the Bohr-Sommerfeld theory. And so they were looking at silver atoms, and they knew that silver had one valence electron in the sort of the chemistry that was understood about silver at the time. And this theory predicted that the ground state for this valence electron was n uh, equals 1 and k equals 1, and it had an m value of plus or minus 1. So that was describing the z component of the electron's orbital angular momentum. Remember, in the bohr summerfield model, m equals 0 was not allowed. So they did an experiment where they took a beam of silver atoms that were neutral, they were in a metal vapor, and they were in an oven, and the, the, the vapors came out of the oven. This is very similar to what we saw in the uh, uh, kinetic theory of gases experiments. And so this metal vapor was coming out, and it was sent into a magnetic field that had a gradient. So it was a non-uniform magnetic field. So as these metal atoms came out, if they had a Z component that was pointing up, then in this gradient they would fly up. If they had a Z component pointing down in this gradient, they would fly down. And if the Z component was zero, which they didn't expect, it would go straight through and, and not be deflected up or down. So in this quantized picture, they expected their silver atoms to not give them a continuum of, 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 uh, orient, of values up and down, but to actually just give you two possible directions up and down with nothing in between. So their detector was just a glass plate. And so let's take a look at what the apparatus looked like. So here's the oven. They had some collimator here to just, you know, to focus the beam down. And then the beam went through the magnetic field. And as it goes through the field, then the angular momentum, the Z component angular momentum, will cause the beam to either go up or go down. And this is the result that they expected. They expected to see only values high and only values low with nothing in between. And classically, we know that if we were putting just classical magnetic dipoles with angular momentum through this, 
that the classical dipole could have any value of z, you know, from, from straight up to straight down and everything in between. So classically, you would expect as these dipoles go through that you would see a continuum of values from the maximum to the, to the minimum there. So some values from minus the maximum to, to the minimum would be observed for this experiment where you're measuring the z component. All right, so this is only possible by taking the fact that we have an angular momentum and a magnetic dipole together, living together, as we, fly, as we make these atoms fly through this apparatus, through this gradient, causing them to, to move up or down based on the size of their, M, their mu z component. And so what Sommerfeld predicted was there should only be two outcomes, plus or minus one, and in fact, that's indeed what they saw. So it took them a couple years, or over a year, of refining the apparatus, and they were able to see two clear lines with a gap between them. And in fact, actually, they, they made a postcard of their, uh, made a picture of, of their plate. So here is with the, the, a picture with the, with, the, with the magnetic field off, and here's with the magnetic field gradient on, and you can see that it was split into two, a top part and a bottom part. So the, the direction of the gradient was along this direction here. And they actually wrote on this postcard, attached this experimental proof of directional quantization. We congratulate you on the confirmation of your theory. And he sent this to, they sent this to Niels Bohr in 1922. Now, this was before de Broglie's hypothesis in 1923, right? And Schrodinger's wave equation was 1925. So why they were, they actually showed something that was very important, that there was quantization of, of the angular momentum. They didn't really understand the full significance of it until the, the full wave equation from, from Schrodinger and solving the hydrogen atom was, was worked out. And so later, after Schrodinger worked out the hydrogen atom and all the solutions, Phipps and Taylor in 1927 did the same experiment with the beam of hydrogen atoms. So now you have a whole bunch of hydrogen atoms where they're in their ground state. So they took a beam of hydrogen atoms with n equals 1, l equals 0, and m sub l equals 0. They knew that there was no angular momentum for the electron in this ground state. So because there was no angular momentum, there should be no magnetic dipole moment. And when they pass these beam of hydrogen atoms through the stern gerlach apparatus, they actually saw the beam split into two discrete outcomes, up and down, even though the hydrogen atom that they were using were ground state hydrogen atoms, and according to Schrodinger's picture, there should be no angular momentum and no magnetic dipole moment. So it was at this point that it was clear that Schrodinger's picture for the hydrogen atom was really not complete. So even though he was able to explain so much of the spectroscopy, the, the atomic spectra from hydrogen, he still was not being able to account for this strange behavior here. And so to get that, uh, we realize that somehow the electron has some kind of intrinsic magnetic moment that is built into it. So this is something called the spin angular momentum. So instead, in addition to this orbital angular momentum, the electron is acting as if it's some charged particle that's spinning, although that idea is not quite uh, correct. So the, the picture, though, seems like the electron somehow is spinning about its axis and it's got some kind of quantization due to the spinning. But the problem with that is that if it was a really a sphere that was spinning, then it should only have integer values of spin angular momentum, which means that they should either have L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2, L equals 3, and so on. And so the M sub L values would either have to be M, M sub L equals 0 for L equals 0, or M sub L equals minus 1, 0, and plus 1 for L equals 1, and so on. But they were only getting two outcomes, was only, which was only consistent with a spin, in this case S instead of L, a spin of 1 half, and M sub S values of plus or minus a half. And that was not allowed in this picture of a classical spinning ball. You know, if you take the, the electron as a, as a classical spinning ball and you just quantized it, then you wouldn't have this kind of outcome. So something was peculiar here. Even though they were getting, they were getting the same outcome as Stern and Gerlach, uh, 
they knew they shouldn't have gotten it with this beam of hydrogen atoms in their ground state. So this spin was proposed, but why it had these half energy values was not understood. It wasn't until Paul Dirac came along in 1929 that he put together a wave equation that was relativistically invariant, that was, that was take all of relativity into account. And in that derivation, he showed that the electron must have an intrinsic angular momentum of s equals half and a magnetic moment given by an intrinsic magnetic moment given by minus g s mu b over h bar times s. And this g is a value of 2.002319, so on. It's called, something called the electron g factor. So this magnetic dipole moment then would have a magnitude that looks like this here, where, where we now have g s times mu b times the length of that uh, angular momentum vector. And in this relativistic equation that he proposed, he actually also discovered that the electron, uh, it, there's also something called the anti-electron that exists and antimatter which exists. So this wave equation was, uh, was able to account for all of the sort of special relativity cases, but it was also predicted this behavior. Now, as I said before, when Schrodinger came up with his wave equation, he just sort of put it together based on the information that he had. He didn't try to make it relativistically invariant, but many scientists knew that somebody had to try to come up with a relativistic version, but there were a lot of attempts that didn't quite work out, and it wasn't until Dirac came up with his relativistic equation, again, for the same way, just sort of, you know, started trying different things and finally came up with equation, a wave equation that worked. Uh, and that's now the equation that we sort of all agree is the wave equation for electrons if you want to be complete in terms of your relativistic treatment. So instead of going to this Dirac equation, which I don't want to get to because it's actually fairly complicated, and we don't need to because we can actually modify the Schrodinger equation in an ad hoc way to include this property of spin, by just multiplying the Schrodinger solutions by another wave function, which is just a function of the spin state. So these spin parts are, will have, are stationary states that will have values for m sub s of half and minus half. And we're gonna, we can write any wave function for its spin part as some linear combination of these two states that we're going to call uh, the, the uh, alpha for the associated with the plus half and beta associated with the minus half. So we can write any linear combination of those guys and these guys are all guaranteed to be orthogonal. So if we do sort of the integrals uh, as we did before, then these guys would, would be equal to one and these guys would be equal to zero. And now what we do then is we write the hydrogen atom with this additional multiplier here, which is the spin wave function. And this whole thing now becomes something called a spin orbital. So in addition to n, l, and m sub l, we need to include uh, uh, m sub s. And so that depends on the state of the uh, electron, which is uh, electron spin, which is now included in this spin orbital uh, wave function. So now the hydrogen atom stationary states are going to be defined by four quantum numbers n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. And with this sort of shorthand that we developed over here, we're going we're gonna to write down then that these wave functions that we have here then are going to be given by this symbol here, and these guys are going to be given by the symbols here. All right? And when we talk about the spin states uh, and the orbital states, then we will describe them with these kind of diagrams called an orbital diagram. So we'll say that there's the n equals 1, the n equals 2, the n equals 3 states. Here's the, the l equals 0 for n equals 1, l equals 0, 1, and for, l, for n equals 2, l equals 0, 1, and 2 for n equals 3, and then we have the corresponding m sub l states. And so to, to indicate the state of the electron, we're just going to draw an arrow up for plus half and an arrow down for minus half, which is something you should all sort of be familiar with. 
So now we come back to describing the electron's total magnetic dipole moment operator, and now we see that we have two contributions. We have a contribution from the orbital part and a contribution from now this spin part. And we can write those in terms of the orbital angular momentum and now the spin angular momentum. And these are the expressions we have now. We're just going to introduce for, to, for, to make them consistent in addition to the g factor for the electron, which is 2.023 or so. We're going to include a gl for the orbit, which we'll just set equal to 1. So now we write the total angular momentum vector, uh, I'm sorry, the total magnetic dipole moment vector for the electron is given by this expression here, minus mu b over h bar and then times gll gs s. And similarly, the z component will be minus mu b over h bar gllz plus gs sc. Okay, and now we've finished this part of the story. We've, com we've found the missing piece that we need for describing the moment, the magnetic moment of electrons and what you need if you want to go deeper into understanding magnetism.